So first of all, I am super excited. I know we've been trying to hop on this call, <laughs> get on this interview. Um, literally, I've been seeing your videos go viral all like literally in different places on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok. So when I saw you, I was like, oh, I have to get Michaela Blight on here because she is phenomenal. Also, I have a rugby background. I played rugby for about two years and i loved it and i actually got the really rare experience to go to new zealand and train i did um, and I it did was see that so when you started following me and i went on to your um on your instagram i saw that you followed renee and maybe portia as well or they followed you and i was like okay for them to follow you you must be like you know either a kiwi or like huge with something because i don't really follow american um, football or anything um, and then they said that you came yeah. to Bay of Plenty and played rugby in Bay of Plenty I was like well, okay <laughs> I didn't know this so cool <laughs> yeah no, it was like a, a really random experience but I did I mean I get them I got to meet Portia um got to meet some of the other girls and I was just like man this is this is a different level of rugby so yes yeah, so again thank you for hopping on with us um I kind of want to get started. Um, normally, I tell people all the time when I interview all of my amazing athletes, I say, I can tell everybody your background, your bio, you know, but I, I know I'm not going to do it justice. So I would love for you to kind of tell my audience a little about who you are, what you do, and how did you get into rugby? Uh, so rugby was my first sport at the age of five. Um, but back then it was two-handed touch on the hips. Um, and it was just to encourage young kids to get used to the, like the basic um, fundamental skills of tackling uh, and so I played that up until about eighth grade uh, and then I had to go up to the tackle grade but I was way too scared. I'm, I'm not the biggest person on the field and so um, compared to my brothers I was quite small and uh, especially compared to boys my own age I was quite small and so I played football for a bit um, and gave rugby a little bit of a break and so played soccer, athletics, basketball, played most other random sports, um, but loved soccer and athletics. They were my ultimate favourites. And then came back to rugby in 2012 uh, at my high school in New Plymouth. Uh, but rugby has been a part of my life since before I was even thought of. My mum played for the Black Ferns. Um, my, bla my dad played for, um, you know, club and Taranaki. So, um it's always been a part of my blood and it's always been a part of my family and um, it's just a sport in New Zealand that everyone loves and so you've got to get into it at some point of your life. Um, but yeah. when the Women's Sevens, I guess you could say squad, um, was starting to develop again in 2012 to prepare for the 2016 Olympic Games, uh, that's when I decided to give the sport a go. So I was 16 at the time and didn't have any high hopes. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll just try a new sport, um, but made the squad with a couple other um, girls from my region and then just haven't really looked back, just kept going and they can't get rid of me. So it's been 12 <laughs> years so far of being in the squad and um, I, I love the sport. It's grown massively. So, yeah, it's just um, a sport that has really helped me grow my resilience and my work ethic and, my strength so I'm very grateful for it I love that I love that um I if your parents were playing on I have a level it was almost like they were probably like putting a rugby ball to to the to her stomach when you were when you were in the inner so we said hey this is your future right here yeah so that's, that's pretty awesome yeah I, I absolutely love that so can you kind of share um I guess some of the challenges you faced when you first kind of got into rugby and how you overcame that um the ultimate obstacle was that I was just so tiny um I you know like don't get me wrong I, I had a little bit of bulk from um from doing athletics for years um so I definitely wasn't weak but compared to the other women who were in the squad they were oh some of them had been in the Black Ferns team since I don't know five six seven eight nine years so they were um well-established rugby players and were full-grown women where I was a 16-year-old girl just learning a new sport and so my patience was tested a little bit because uh in trials I wanted to be just like them and keep up with them and be as strong as them 
Um, but there were times where I was just literally getting carried on the field because um, I was just so tiny. So um, that was definitely my first obstacle was, you know, understanding my size, but I was very quick. And so I just made sure that every time I caught the ball, I just ran around as many people as I possibly could uh, and just grew my confidence in the contact area because um, getting tackled by, you know, 80, 90 kilo women who are strong, powerful beings that have played rugby for years for their country yes. is very scary. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a couple of things. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah. Oh, look, I... <laughs> I can understand being being small, but definitely like your situation is on a different level because you're playing for a national team and you're playing for literally the best national team. Um, so I can only imagine how um, coming into the sport and just being like, hey, I might I'm a little bit smaller compared to everybody else, but you have that. Speed. So. That's what I feel like your advantage is, is the fact that, first of all, I mean, even being smaller, not you're strong, but also the fact that you have that burst of speed that really nobody can keep up with. So um, I Sometimes. look. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 that's amazing. So I saw something recently on your Instagram. I saw that um, you all had reached uh, your 50 tournaments and you guys were setting records, right? Um, yeah, so there's been a that, few things that our team have um, definitely, you know, set. Like Tyler um, recently is the all-time points leading scorer, if that's how yes. it's called. So she's got the most points out of all women's sevens players. So, yeah, there's been a wow. few milestones that our team has accomplished, which is cool. Wow. So with that, with that, with those, you know, accomplishments happening, and, of course, you know, the Olympics is right around the corner – what are you all looking forward to with this Olympics coming up? Because I know this is going to be, um, again, a big Olympics pretty much for everybody. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about this Olympics, to be honest, because I feel like what's happening right now in women's sports is phenomenal. I feel like women are getting more, honestly, shine, more visibility. But obviously, there's still some ways that we have to go. So I feel like going into this Olympics, um, what are you all hopeful for? Outside of, of course, taking home that goal, what are you all kind of looking forward to as far as like how this might change the game a little bit since it's now on, I would say, a more visible platform? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the, the part that I'm most grateful for with Sevens being in the Olympics is uh, the fact that we're playing after the boys. It's very common for women rugby games to be played before a men's rugby game like whether it's you know on the same day or if it's a tournament it's always the men's final that's last and so um our tournament is after them so hopefully it makes people want to hang around for the whole six days uh to watch yes. the women play yes. um but again like when we played in tokyo in 2021 um the impact that we made on well I mean definitely across the world but definitely in New Zealand we had so many young girls that suddenly saw um, that it is possible for women to play rugby for their country and win gold um, in 2016 at the Rio Olympics it wasn't it wasn't anywhere near as grown or as developed as it is now and so we didn't really have the same impact um, as what we did in Tokyo um, and so I guess in Paris we just want to do the same thing we want young girls and boys to see the sport of sevens. Um, we also want especially young girls to see that they can play for their country at the Olympic Games um, and play rugby sevens. So we want to do that again. We want to inspire so many people by going back to back with gold medals. Um, but before any of that, we need to inspire ourselves. We need to motivate ourselves because with that self-belief, um, we can be, you know, indestructible um but this yes. season has been um a bit of a roller coaster we obviously haven't been very consistent with our world series um results and so this olympics is very different in regards to tokyo because we've all had a solid season yeah. whereas leading into tokyo there was covid and some teams only played maybe two or three tournaments leading into tokyo we would have had maybe four or five tournaments and three of them were against australia and Fiji, uh, which was perfect for us because at the time we were probably the top three teams um, on the World Series. 
And so we had a massive advantage over so many other people. Whereas this time, it's a level playing field. Everyone's been at the World Series. Everyone's played great rugby. Um, there's probably, I would say, 90% of teams have their full strength squad. Um, so there's not a lot of injuries that have gone around, which is great, yeah. um, which is what we want, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's going to be a massive um, tournament in regards to the development of the game, um, with it being a third Olympics for sevens. Uh, it's just going to be a whole different kind of level of skill set. And with it being in Paris, I've been in Paris a couple times, and the French yeah. are extremely passionate, especially with rugby. <laughs> so we are super oh, okay. excited. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that is beautiful. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see um just the energy um at Paris and around rugby because I know here in America it is um there are there are more little girls getting involved. Um, there are there's starting to be like you know professional leagues popping up here and there. So there's just more opportunity. And I always say, when it, whenever anybody says, what is your favorite sport? Because, you know, I ran track my whole life. Um, I, you know, played football as well. But I always say rugby because the culture is just, is different. And and I feel like anybody and everybody that is a rugby fan and who plays a sport, it's a different level of passion. So to see you all come together um, in, you know, in, in Paris is going to be honestly dynamic. Um, and, you know, I have some friends that I'm hoping – you know, go out there and do well. But I'm just excited for the sport and the growth. Um, and again, just the visibility. Um, so, yeah, um, I can't wait to see what you all do. I um, agree with you. Yeah. So I have to kind of break this down for my viewers because a lot of them don't really know a lot about rugby. And I really want to bring, again, more awareness and visibility to the sport. So can you kind of explain just really quickly, like, and 15. <laughs> um, so the difference is, the the biggest difference is that there's only seven people on the field um, and you play for seven minutes per half. So there's two halves. Uh, so 14 minutes all up. Uh, the same, pretty much the exact same rules um, in regards to, you know, tackling, the breakdown. Um, the There's obviously like little bits and pieces that are very different. So when you score a try in sevens, you then take that kickoff, the next one. Whereas in fifteens, if you score a try, the other team will kick it off back to you to restart the play. Um, so there's little minor differences like that, but as a whole, it's the same game. Um, there's obviously lineouts and scrums and um, kickoffs, conversions, all of that as well. Uh, but just changed a little bit differently to suit the speed and the um, dynamic of the game of sevens um, and I guess people are just so attracted to the fact that it's fast um, and you know people go and watch yeah. a game of 15s and it's like a two-hour period of your day where you go and sit down you watch an 80-minute game and then you go home whereas with sevens um, you yeah. could potentially watch gosh like 15 matches a day um, of different countries yes. and um, you know we could play twice or three times in one day depending on what kind of tournament and it's a party in the stadium everyone's dressed up everyone's say, celebrating yeah. <laughs> I mean I'd yeah. much rather be in the seven stadium than a 15 stadium because you have a party at the same time it's great <laughs> exactly exactly yeah I, look it's, it is interesting. The energy is very different um, surrounding like the two the two different events. But I felt like sevens, and this is from, again, uh, not someone that was on a professional level, but I felt like the difference for what, like for me, what I experienced, because I, I tried both. And I think being a sevens player, trying to play 15s, I was like literally out of breath the whole entire game. I feel you. <laughs> I, like, I feel you. I I feel like being a winger, like the ball never made it to me either. So I was just also like, okay, I'm just running back and forth. And I felt like it was just always just a, a battle in the middle. Um, but runners, 15 remind me of like long distance runner, mid distance runners and things like that. So that's the best way I try to. If you're a sevens player, you're probably like a little bit of a speedster and have some, like a lot of skills. 
And I feel like in the 15s, like you're bigger, you're stronger, you're a little bit more resilient. So yeah, just for everybody who's been asking me uh, the, the question, this is a profession right here. So I think I did a little bit of a, a, a little bit of justice explaining it, but no, you're talking well. <laughs> but I appreciate that. Um, again, I, I'm trying to just raise awareness about it because it is such an amazing sport, and I do feel like there's so many opportunities your um little girls to get into this sport and it literally takes you around the world um that's something that i truly loved about the sport was again not only were, was the camaraderie and the, and the fact that you can literally knock somebody's head off and then go and get a beer yeah <laughs> versus in american football that just doesn't happen so kind of explain that you know since you've been doing this for so long why is the culture of rugby the way that it is? Why is it the, the fact that you can have, you know, these fierce, like, one-on-one, head-on, you know, uh, crucial battles, right, on the field? But then right after, you guys are, like, hugging it out, you know, best friends, going to get a beer, singing rugby songs. Like, why do you feel that is when it comes to rugby versus any other sport? Um, I think rugby is such an inclusive sport because you don't have to be a certain shape or size. Uh, you look at the positions from prop to fullback, we are all completely different heights, weights, size, strength. And so I think um, the the most important part about rugby is that you don't have to fit in a certain bubble. Uh, and I think a lot of people appreciate that. Um, you know, when you think of sports like netball, basketball, I mean, you have to be six foot tall, otherwise you'll struggle. Or... Um, you know, and I mean, I guess another sport would be American football. Uh, you've definitely got to have size on you. You've got to have speed on you. But then obviously, I don't know what they're called, but I'm going to call them the front row, the people that do the hut hut thing. Um, you know, oh, you, yeah. you've, got to, <laughs> you've got to definitely have it's a bit of size way. on you. So um, there's different, different, and gymnastics is another classic one. Like you've got to be petite, you've got to mm. be flexible. Um, but yeah. rugby as a whole, you could just be from anywhere look at any certain type like there's no um cv that you have to fit and i think that's been a massive benefit for rugby across the world is that people can just not feel like they have to be able to do something to fit in um so it's such an inclusive sport and um you know in new zealand we obviously have club rugby so most saturday sometimes on a sunday your club rugby team whatever age you are will play against um another team and at the end of the day you you have a sausage and bread or you have an orange juice or you have you know hot chips and you gather yeah. around and you socialize you're all friends um because you just genuinely just want to play a sport that you love um yeah. at club rugby level like it's just it's a community that brings so many people together and just have the same love over this you know the same thing which is just rugby um, exactly. And that's why I actually loved club rugby as a kid was that even though I hated losing, um, I would always cry if we lost. Uh, but at the end of the day, we walked off the field and we were super excited about playing or there'd be kids that would be, you know, celebrating scoring a try or making a tackle or whatever it was. You know, it was just such a positive yeah. environment to be around. Um, but I guess also okay. at the same time, with it being a contact sport, um, it was important that we made sure that everyone was safe, um, was playing the sport safely and looking after one another. Um, so that's important as well in regards to our sport because uh, we make a lot of tackles and we don't have shoulder pads and helmets on. So <laughs> we've got to make sure that we're looking after our brains and our yeah. body as well, no matter what age we are. Oh, wow. I. I love that. Uh, again, it's just, it's so different from what we experience here. Um, so I just feel like everybody needs to, if you're, even if you're not going to play, just go and be a part of like the sport, you know, go and watch, go and support because it is different. And it makes you look at, you know, sometimes the sports here and it's like, hmm, why don't we have that? Because it's, it, I feel like, you know, you walk away from a lot of games and basketball games and even track meets and it's like, you don't even want to see the other competitor again, you know, definitely if you don't win, but it's just, um, it's a very, I don't know. It's a very inspiring sport because it's like, man, if, if we could change that culture here in America with some sports, I feel like there'd be more kids involved in more sports um, because everybody doesn't want to, you know, I guess have to 
again, go and compete and then you lose. And then, you know, you, you have enemies now, you know, some people want to just enjoy the sport and the culture and things like that. So I just thought it was interesting when I came back home and I was like, wow, this was different. <laughs> yeah. Very, rugby, very, very different. Rugby in New Zealand is something that we always are so proud to talk about. Uh, it just brings so many people, obviously in New Zealand, but across the world together uh, and just, you know, no matter what language you speak or where you come from or what your childhood was like, um, you know, rugby is just someone that brings everyone together and is extremely inclusive. But, I mean, in, in saying that, though, when we play the international stage, you know, <laughs> we're not the best of friends with Australia. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's definitely oh, okay. still that, you know, that camaraderie and that, um, that competition amongst other teams. Um, but that's, you know, that's yeah. part of being a high-performance athlete and uh, playing a sport that's in the Olympic Games. We've all got the same goal of wanting to win a gold medal. And so anything less of that is disappointing. Um, and so, yeah, there's still yeah. that competitive edge always. But at the end of the day, when yeah. we go out to the clubs after the tournament, we're just like, oh, my God, why why is we even, like, bothering with that kind of energy? Like, we just love the game of rugby. Yeah. Um, there's some girls on the series that I've known for 10 years, you know. So we've grown up in the sport as well. Um, so there's loads yeah. of people that, you know, have this same passion and love and, um, then you see other girls come in at the age of 18 and they're just babies. And um, it's it's, incred it's incredible to kind of see the sport grow in that sense as well. So we just got to remind ourselves that we're playing a sport that we love and that's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, again, I, I just love the culture. So I went on a tangent about that. So let, let's get back to the, <laughs> the actual questions. Oh, okay, so... Um, so I know we kind of talked about a little bit about um, kind of the recent challenges with you guys kind of um, unfortunately kind of having to end that long winning streak. So how are you all kind of, I guess, what is your plan and what is how are you guys kind of leading the team to bounce back from that? And what are some of the key lessons you learned and how are you going to take that into um, the Olympics? Um, well, at the beginning of the season, we we had a plan in in, um, in place, and we all agreed to it. We all trusted the management, the trainers, the coaches, um, and so going into the series in December last year, obviously the ultimate goal was for us to win all the World Series tournaments. Um, but at the end of the day, the biggest picture was being in prime. Um, condition to win an Olympic gold medal. That was the ultimate. And so we took a lot of learnings out of all of the tournaments that we have lost this season, uh, which was due by Cape Town and Perth. Um, and at the end of the day, when you aren't training the at the level that you want to play at, at the World Series, you'll get spotted. And so it's not that we weren't training hard. We train hard every single day. Um, but I guess when it came to the rugby part of it, we did too much. It was almost like we were too excited to be back on the World Series and um, we had girls that were doing too much stuff individually and not, this is rugby terminology, but not using the ball and making the ball do the work. Um, mm -hmm. And so that we got many learnings from the start of the season to literally be patient, to calm down, and to understand that we are very good rugby players and we don't need to be running, you know, four-minute 30 Broncos or we don't need to be sprinting this. Well, we do need to sprint fast, but it helps a lot. Uh, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, we don't have to be these incredibly ridiculous athletes to be amazing rugby players because naturally we are great rugby players um so we just had to remind ourselves that but we also had to start being a little bit more honest with ourselves um in regards to if we were doing enough and so going up to for example I play wing and so the main person I play alongside is my center and so being honest with my centers and being like is this combo working um where can we be better why isn't it working? Um, and so we've had lots of chops and changes in regards to our combinations who we play alongside on the field um, because those combinations are really important leading into the Olympic Games so then we can read off each other naturally. 
um, and be able to understand what each other do on attack and defense without having to speak. Uh, because what people yeah. don't realize on um, the rugby field, especially through the TV, is that there is a lot of constant chat going on on the field. So if you yeah. add chat as well as um, being fatigued and tired, yeah. Um, that's where the element is different in regards to 15s. Um, you're constantly working for 14 minutes, give or yeah. take the stoppages, obviously, for scrums and lineouts, but you're constantly having to do something. Um, and so we've got to make sure that we've got an elite combination with everyone on the field, but especially with your player. So for me, it's my centre. Um, so leading into the Olympics, it's we'll be in a place where the 12 that are selected um, – are the best athletes and best rugby players in the country and in the world. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're on the right track. We um, yes. <laughs> didn't start off well, but we're definitely in a place where we now believe in ourselves again. Um, the challenge now is holding the consistency um, and making sure that we don't get complacent, which is non, it's non-existent in our environment. Yeah. Um, the classic Kiwi culture is that complacency is non-existent. Um, and so we're just going to keep pushing each other um, because at the end of the day, we all want the same goal. And that's for this team, no matter who gets selected, um, to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. a layer of okay now we're training for the which is the olympics how how do you all i feel like balance that okay yes we're gonna go out here and we're gonna train 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 prepare 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 but also balance being humans and having families and having children and friends and things like that how is that balance you know how do you how do you how do you balance it and still get still be able to just have a life I love that question. Um, so it helps that we have a um, psychiatrist who um, specialises in sport um, and the sport mentality. Um, so talking to her helps a lot, but we always talk about in our environment um, that you are all in, but family first. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of us girls, so to, to break it down a little bit more, um, here in Tauranga, um, we are all centralised here as a sevens program, so we all live in the same region. Um, so a lot of our girls have moved away from home to live here. Um, so I moved from New Plymouth, which is a four-hour drive um, from here south. Um, some girls have uh, moved here from Invercargill, which is at the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand. And wow. so we've literally left our normalities to be here and be high performance full time athletes, um, and so it's important that not only we look after each other in the sense of that we are away from our families for probably ninety percent of the year, um, but we're around each other all the time. And so when you get twenty girls who are around each other all the time, it could either work out really well or get really toxic. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so that's where the culture part comes in, is making sure that we are all on the same page and all in with our culture and our environment and agree with the values and morals that we uphold, um, but also encouraging everyone, whether you're our oldest is, I think Kelly's nearly 34 um, or nearly 35, our youngest just turned 18. Um, then we have some girls who have kids, some have husbands, some have wives, um, and then some are single Pringles that just study at home. Um, so just making sure that we are telling each other and encouraging each other to live a normal human life. Go home, go rest, go sleep for 15 hours if you want to, go to the pub if you want to, um, but also have a life outside of rugby. Um, so most of the yeah. girls study. Um, some girls have, um, so for example, our captain, Sarah, um, she has a couple, I guess you could say side hustles um, that keep her busy while she's recovering from her ACL injury. Um, we've mm -hmm. got girls who have dogs. That's one of um, one of the ones that has a fur baby. So oh, something okay. that just constantly is 
getting your mind away from rugby is really important. You can't be rugby 24-7. You'll burn out. No, You'll just go insane. You know, it's like yeah. that with any sport. Um, yeah. I hear a lot of, like, professional athletes say that, you know, they're just committed fully, loyal to their sport. They don't, you know, I'm, I don't want to use the word sacrifice because I prefer to use the word choice. I'm choosing yeah. to do this. I'm choosing to be at training. I'm choosing to not eat this or not drink that. But at the end of the day, we're all human. Um, yeah. And if you want to get on the piss, <laughs> if you want to <laughs> have three pizzas for dinner, go yeah. for it. If that makes you happy and that makes you come to training on Monday morning with a full heart um, and, a, and a better place mentally, great. We're, we're all for it. There's obviously a balance in regards to that kind of stuff. But right. um, <laughs> we encourage everyone to just be humans. Put your family first. Go and see your go and see your partner. Go and see your mum and dad. Um, because at the end of the day, being a high performance athlete it seems on the outside like an incredible lifestyle, but man, it's draining. It can be so draining on the body, on the mind. So just taking a break from it is actually really nice. Resetting everything. So when you come into training on Monday or when you go to a tournament overseas, um, you're in the best place that you can be possibly. Um, to perform yeah. for your country um, so we have a lot of pressure on our shoulders playing for our country so uh, it's sure. important that we look after ourselves um, before yeah. we you know rugby's not forever it's just a game so look after us first as human beings so we can come into yes. our environment and give a hundred percent every time wow uh, I love that um, and I I still think that there's not a lot, a lot, enough conversation around athlete mental health. I feel like it's getting, it's starting to become more of a thing. But what do you feel is still being overlooked when it comes to that? Like the athlete and their mental health and being able to take breaks without being, you know, made fun of. Like I, I know we saw how how Simone Bowles when she took her break, it's like the whole world turned on her. But she was like, I'm literally going through a mental crisis, and everybody's like, oh shut up, you're an athlete. You chose that. So when it comes to that, what are your feelings and thoughts around how society perceives athletes as these superheroes? And yes, athletes are amazing, right? We are normally we're in the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. But again, kind of like what you said, we're still human. So what are your thoughts around society when it comes to, you know, people feeling like, oh, you're just supposed to play. It doesn't matter. You chose this. You're the best at what you do. So you have to just keep going no matter what. Yeah, I always have to remind, uh, especially our young girls that come into our environment, social media is so dangerous. Um, and we're always going to have those hard those hundy fans who will criticize us, um, who will tell us when we lose that we're not good enough or um, that we need to drop some players or whatever it is. Um, but, at the, you know, we always have to tell each other what's more important. People that you have no idea who they are, who are strangers, probably sitting on a couch being a potato, okay. or you and your family and your friends that you love and care for, who truly know who you are as well. Um, because social media is whenever we get onto social media whenever we're portrayed on tv or whatever it is we're always going to have opinions no matter what yes. that's never going to disappear that's never going to um, end it's how we handle all of that um as in an individual process so for yeah. me i just ignore social media i just don't even bother looking at comments anymore um, because yeah. even when we win, you can't please everyone. There is no way you will it's be able possible. to please. Literally it's possible. not possible. No, not possible. So why put your energy into something that's not important, that's not part of your values, when you can put that energy into yourself, when you can put that energy into your yep. team? Um, we, yep. we recently, I don't know if you know this guy, but his name's Eric Murray. Um, he rode for New Zealand for oh, maybe 10, 11, 12 years and never lost a race for New Zealand uh, in the pair that he had with um, another guy. Um, wow. But he never lost a race and won two Olympic golds, multiple world champs and has quite a few world records. And he um, came into our environment the other day to talk to us about the Olympic Games and preparation. And one of the key messages he said was that to know, your, know yourself, know your purpose and know your why. Know yourself because you as a human being is far more important than anything else. 
know your purpose because if you're here um, just because of, I don't know, you don't want to do anything else, that's not good enough. Um, yeah. Is your purpose to, to make yourself proud to represent your country or is your purpose to inspire your young nieces and nephews or your sons and daughters or whatever it is uh, and then know your why. Who are yes. the ones that are behind you and around you and in front of you, um, side by side, that are helping you and supporting you and encouraging you to be the best human being that you possibly can be? If you that. think about that more than social media, then your energy is in the right place. Um, so we just have to look out for one another in regards to that. We've had it so much, Santia. Honestly, like the times that we imagine. Were, Oh, it's horrible. Like we lost um, in 2022, we lost the Commonwealth Games and the Sevens World Cup, both to Aussie. And the social media outrage just went berserk. Um, the amount of comments that said, drop this player, you're not good enough, drop the coach. Um, it was just insane. It honestly makes you think, that those type of people clearly don't have lives. <laughs> so, no, it's clearly, literally, literally, they have nothing else to do. Yeah, like, what is your purpose in life? <laughs> right. I mean, look at what y'all are doing. Y'all are literally on the highest level. So, like, why you're watching? So that to me, I'll, that's always a comment back. Like, what are you doing? Do you see what I'm doing? I'm a, and again, it, 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 it's it's unfortunate that it is sometimes it becomes a very toxic environment. I feel like for a lot of athletes, when you are playing at such a high level and the and everybody expects you to just win every, like pretty much be robotic. Like there's really no way that you can get tired, sad, sleepy, hungry. Like you just have to be this robotic, you know, athlete. And the reality is you're going to have bad games. You're going to have bad days and that's life. You're not going to win them all. It's just, it's not possible. And how can you get better if you are for always winning, right? How can you reach the next level? So it's, I just hate to see that because I I have so many friends that um, fell into depression um, through some of those things because, again, being some of the best at what they do and then getting injured sometimes. It, even getting injured, if you get injured, that is like, oh, like, how are you? How did you get injured? Like, why are you injured? Why are you not trying? And I'm like, what? How are you going to get mad at an athlete for getting You can't even control it, you know? Oh. So it's like you do have to just shut it off sometimes and just take a break. Um, I remember getting injured because I'm actually recovered from ACL surgery from football. And man, the the negativity. And I had to just like take a mental break and just say, you know what? I don't know these people. Mm. I like at the end of the day, like again, like you said, they're just somebody with twi Twitter fingers behind the screen. Yep. Uh, I guess just feeling themselves for the day or whatever's going on. So I had to yep. realize like just focus on what you're doing. Focus on the people that actually love you and care about you and want to see you succeed. And everybody else is just, you know, they're just there for the attention, I guess. That's that's just what I learned. So yep. I love your mentality. Um, and and kind of I feel like you're you almost segued into my one of my last questions for you. What legacy do you want to leave? Because you you've you've done so much, literally. Like you you're one of the most prominent female rugby players on earth right now. So what legacy are you looking to to leave? Um yeah, wow. Um you know, when I was when I was 18 and I debuted for the Black Friend Sevens uh on the World Series, uh, my debut tournament was in Atlanta, uh and it was snowing, mm -hmm. it was freezing cold. Um what? I remember we won the final, like we were quite dominant in 2014, 2015-ish. Um, and I remember we won the final. I played bugger all. I was I was behind Porsche, and uh, Porsche wasn't going to get subbed ever. <laughs> um, and I remember watching. Um, so, Goss, uh, Sarah, our captain, um, she's injured at the moment. She was got. She was up on stage on the field or whatever, and she was receiving this. Um, she either won player of the final or player of the tournament or something. Um, and she was receiving this award. And I remember like watching her with the rest of the team, and I thought to myself that will never be me. Uh, but back then, like, I was behind four or five elite wingers. Portia Woodman, just to rattle off some names, Honey Hitami, Carla Hallhepper, Ruby Tui, when she was um, yeah. playing striker. So I was at the bottom of the food chain. I had probably next to no self-belief in myself for a long time. Um, 
And then in 2016, I was the traveling reserve for the Olympic team uh, and the girls got silver. And I remember coming home from that tournament and I said to myself, I never want to feel that feeling ever again of being on the sideline. Like it sucked. I chose to move away from my family. I chose a dream that seemed really ridiculous at the time, but I wanted to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games and I fell short. Uh, Our team fell short. And so when I went home from those Olympic Games in 2016, I worked so hard because my ultimate goal was to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. But before that, I just wanted to be a known, you know, valued rugby player in my team. I wanted to be consistently being selected. I wanted the coaches to have no reason to not select me. Um, And so I got myself to a place that's at this time I'm 20 Um, I got myself to a place where I was the fittest and fastest and strongest I'd ever been, but also confident in my ability on the rugby field. And so from December 2016, uh, I suddenly started to peak a little bit more. I went from being travelling reserve at the Olympic Games in 2016 to one year later being named World Rugby Woman Sevens Player of the Year. And in the space of twelve months, it was yeah. thanks. In the space of twelve months, it was a lot. Uh, it was suddenly a lot of attention. Uh, suddenly a lot of pressure, um, expectations. And so, by putting that on myself, you could either thrive or survive. And mm. there were bits and pieces where I thrived, but then there were other bits and pieces where I was just like, I don't want this anymore. Like it's too much. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, today, eight years later, oh my gosh, um, (laughs) doing what I've done, uh, with all the individual accolades, with an Olympic gold, with a couple Com Games medals, a couple World Cup medals, uh, a couple World Rugby Women's Sevens Player of the Year awards, I couldn't have done any of that, uh, without the teammates that I had around me. And so... In regards to your question, the legacy that I want to leave behind is that I want to leave an imprint in the team of the Black Friend Sevens, uh, whether that's by the individual stuff that I've done or um, the the role that I had on the rugby field as a winger, um, the standard that I uphold in myself as a rugby player and as a winger, um, I want that to be left behind so when I retire, the next person that takes my jersey or takes my spot goes, I want to be just like her. But mm. be themselves at the same time. But see the standard that I set and try and reach that. Um, because we always are going to push ourselves to be the best rugby players that we can be. Uh, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the best rugby player in the world, but the standard that I uphold in my position in the squad um, is very high, as well as what other people uphold in, as themselves in our squad. It's not just me, it's our captain, yeah, it's okay. Portia, it's um, Reese, our current captain right now, it's Sarah, all of them. They have a standard that they that they set in our environment and the challenge is for others to try and get there, try and reach it. Um, yeah. It sounds harsh, but we mean it in a very, very loving way. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> there's so many other things that I mean. I didn't come into the squad when I was 16. To obviously, the ultimate was to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. That was number one. But yeah. all of the other individual stuff that I've done, you know, scoring 200 tries, um, winning World Rugby Player of the Year, winning top try score of the season, all of that stuff, that was not on my mind when I wanted to play the sport. Mm. It was just simply to play a new sport that I loved uh, and win a gold medal at the Olympics. Everything outside of that is a huge bonus, <laughs> a massive bonus um, that I'm extremely grateful for. But yeah, yeah. The, the, legacy, the legacy I want to leave behind is that I leave an imprint that uh, people will never forget. Uh, and we'll always try to reach that standard that I've set. Wow, that's powerful. And look, you've already done it. It's already solidified. <laughs> so, okay. so I hope I, so. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that is. I love that. That's powerful, and that's that's phenomenal. Um, 
Okay, I know I've, I've, I've taken up a lot of your time, but I have I do have two more questions. My race you. day. We've got all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. I didn't want to make sure. I didn't want to like interfere with anything. But you're fine. So I know with you for, for you know as long as you have, you've kind of seen like the landscape of rugby change um, and grow and different things like that. Um, what do you feel like um, the progression as far as like visibility and support for women's rugby? Um, where do you feel like that is at? Do you feel like that still is facing some challenges or do you feel like, um, you know, there's things that might need to be addressed or do you feel like, Hey, honestly, we're good. Like we don't really need anything extra. Yeah. Um, in my honest opinion, uh, women's sevens in New Zealand, well supported. Um, uh, we have been well supported for, eight years, seven years, we've been full-time, um, but 15s is constantly going to be fighting with the men's game in New Zealand forever, mm -hmm. and as much as people want to disagree with that and say, no, it's growing, it's it is growing, I 100% back that it is developing, uh, we have a new um, competition called Super Rugby Opiki, so Super Rugby mm -hmm. in New Zealand, extremely popular, there's uh, off the top of my head, there's 10, 11, 12 um, professional teams that play against each other from February to July-ish. Oh, um, oh. They're full-time paid rugby players, but the women's version of that isn't full-time. Um, the money put into it is like 80% less than, <laughs> um, the, than what men get paid. It is starting to become more of a norm topic uh, in our country that 15s is just not portrayed the same way as the men's game. But in saying yeah. that, the men's rugby game has been professional in New Zealand for so long. Like yeah. we're fighting against a history that is unbreakable. Um, yeah. And that's just part of life. It is what it is. It's like that yeah. everywhere. Um, yeah. The only sport would probably be netball where, you know, netball's always been a predominantly a female sport, whereas rugby mm. in New Zealand has always been a male sport um, yes. for many years. You know, women didn't start playing it, oh, gosh, till maybe the 60s or 70s, you know, and by uh -huh. then the All Blacks had been around since the 1800s. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, um, so <laughs> that is a long, long history. history that you've got to break, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so. 15s at the moment in New Zealand has still got a long way to go. Um, I would love to see it at the same level as the men's game where they can be full-time playing for their Super Rugby team or their region team um, because that's the other thing as well. The men's 15s game, if, you play, if you're a male and you play for Bay of Plenty, you mm. get paid maybe like $60,000, which is uh, – Oh, I don't know the terminology, the conversion, uh, maybe 30,000 American dollars or something um, okay. over four or five months. You get paid that to play for Bay of Plenty. But oh, wow. uh, for a woman in New Zealand, if you play for Bay of Plenty, uh, you still got to work. You don't get paid. Mm -hmm. um, it's just for the love of the sport. You play your, so depending on other areas and what squads and whatnot, but yeah. nine times out of 10, you'll train. Tuesday, Thursday nights, you have to fit in your own extra fitness, your own extra gym, um, mm. and nine times out of ten, that's after work for those yeah. that aren't black ferns, um, yeah. or that's around school, or it's around whatever, um, and then you play on a Saturday, and then you go home, whereas the men's game, they are full-time, they're in the environment mm. full-time, you move to that region full-time, um, and you play, you train during the day, um, and then you play and then you go home and then you turn up the next Monday or Tuesday or whatever and you're full-time again training with your squad 24-7. And so it's just things like that where the game has still got a lot of growth to do, but for it to get to that point, there needs to be investment. There needs to be bums on seats. There needs to be yeah. more people who are loyal and hard, uh, passionate fans of the game because yeah. – 
making them watch at home does nothing. You know, exactly. it makes them aware of who we are and what sport we play, but we need investment. We need revenue. We need yes. uh, time and effort into the game to help it grow so we have more people wanting to buy tickets. Um, exactly. We don't get that yet with the women's game just yet. We obviously mm-hmm. sold out Eden Park at the World Cup um, yeah. in New Zealand in 2022. Huge. was massive for our game. Then wow. all of a sudden we went backwards again. Um, mm-hmm. And so we just need to keep growing the regional level of our game, the super rugby level of our game, because yeah. uh, as soon as you play for the Black Ferns, you're paid full time. But yeah. underneath that, you're still struggling. You're still working. You're still having to do other things. Um, so the more investment we get into the game, uh, the more um, the more opportunities it is for our female 15s players to be full-time and to be treated like full-time athletes. So yeah. they don't have to go to work as well as come into training at 7 p.m and try and be amazing rugby players and try and be better when they've just had a full day of work. So yeah, that's tough. It's just things like that, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um... yeah look, I, I understand. Um, I feel like that happens with, like, probably 98% of the sports here in America for women, so I, I totally understand. And you're right, like, I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's life. Um, it is you know, life. there yeah. is a lot. There's always a lot more history with the male side of most sports than the female, and I think that's also just a time thing. You know, as you know, we continue to progress, and you know, years continue to pass. There's more awareness. Um, there becomes more fans and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, like you said, if people aren't there's not butts and seats, if there's not merch sales, if there's not visibility and ad dollars and things like that it's going to be very, very hard to grow anything, um, whether it's a male or female sport. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I really do hope that, you know, the 15s level kind of gets that push and that support that the sevens um, has, because it is still an amazing game. Um, and, you know, I think we can though- take a, a page out of the book. I know that you um, share um, a lot about Caitlin Clark. Yes. Um, and she's an incredible basketballer, obviously. Um, yeah. But essentially, the level that she plays at for her college, I guess, is that what she, um, yeah. she plays for? Um, mm-hmm. That's essentially the same as um, a women's, a 15s women's player playing for their region here. It's essentially the same thing. But yet, mm-hmm. what okay. America has done for basketball over over there and the amount of investment they've put into it like I've seen the post that you've shared around uh, the amount of views that the WNBA draft had simply yeah. because of players like Caitlin Clark um, a- Angel Reese is that her name yes yeah yeah so yep. those players alone have just blown women's basketball just through yes. the roof and that's amazing yeah. like if we can obviously New Zealand is extremely like minuscule compared to America but if we can get to a place where we can have that same sort of um viewing as you know what the men's rugby teams have here in New Zealand but as what the women's basketball have like we would just be yeah. we would skyrocket we would 100% then be full time but that's the thing they you have so many viewers yeah. that want to watch Caitlin Clark or Angel Reese or whoever whoever there are playing in um the WNBA because it's just viewed so much it's it's promoted yeah. so much and so yes uh, hopefully yeah. we can get to that point um here in New Zealand with women's rugby because like what women's basketball has done in America is extremely inspirational like oh credit to them they yeah. have just done amazing to put women's basketball on the map yeah no I mean you're you're correct it, it I think it does take those you know Kind of come and 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 across the world, period. But I think and and you know, like I don't know, I've seen so many amazing female rugby players. Um, and I I do think that's why, honestly, that like the Black Firms, you you are you all are just honestly all phenomenal. You all are playing on a level that is so elite that it, it almost doesn't even seem real. And I feel like when you have those those teams and those level of athletes, that is what gets the people coming in. Um, and also, I just think I think with like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and players like that, 
they came into like uh I feel like it's a it's a different generation now. Everything is on social media. Um, you know, athletes now have like brand visibility versus kind of like, you know, back then it just was like we were just, you know, kind of hustling to just get people to know who we who we are. So I feel like times are changing. So I feel like I truly, 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 truly feel like women's sports is gonna change as a whole here really quickly. Um, of course I, it's, it's still, I don't want to say quickly, but it's gonna, it's gonna change quicker than what, what it's been because social media is, is so vast right now. And there are so many people invested and there are so many people that are like, okay, so if this is happening in basketball, what's happening in tennis, what's happening in Mm -hmm. rugby? What, because I feel like the, it's going to spread. It's going to be like a whole, almost like ripple effect for everybody. So my hopes is that every sport gets the attention that it deserves. It gets the investment that it deserves um, because it's so many amazing athletes out here. Um, and I feel like we all put in so much time, and so much effort and so much work and the sacrifices. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to say this, uh, female athletes, we have different struggles. We have different mounts that we have to climb um, because some of us are mothers. Some of us are, you know, wives. And again, I know that there's men that are dads and fathers as well, our husbands as well. But, you know, it, it is just, it's always, it's just a little bit different. It just is. So yeah. I feel like that just needs more attention and more shine as well. So that's why I created Winning Her Way to give uh, phenomenal athletes like you and, and all the other women that I've interviewed and that I will interview a chance to really talk about their story. Because I feel like when you know somebody's stories, that's how you become a fan. That's that's how people buy jerseys. That's how people say, you know what? I want to go actually watch a game. So I'm going to invite my friends out. So that's like what I'm trying to create. And I know I'm just like a little you know, I guess raindrop in the, in the, in the ocean, but I feel like, you know, it starts with just people wanting to actually help the movement of just women's visibility. So thank you for being amazing. Um, thank you for taking your, the, the time out of your super busy schedule. Um, <laughs> definitely on your rest day. Like I feel super special. <laughs> Cause if I already, we go, to, um, <laughs> we go to Singapore tomorrow morning. So, um, oh, that's nice. my last rest day before we travel. So I'm doing nothing. <laughs> I'm I was going to say, home. take a nap when, you, when, you, when we hang up, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, but um, wow. Um, again, you're you're just you're phenomenal. Like I said, when I saw you, uh, you know, come across my screen like a hundred times, I was like, all right, I got I got to get her on the show. I, I'm done. That's I'm good. Done. That I'm means our sports it. going somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's look, it's it's everywhere. I, people were sending me your clips. And I was like, well, okay, yeah, this must be a sign that I got to try to get her on here. So I'm happy we made it work. I know it was a little bit of a struggle, um, but I am super excited about the, your future, your legacy, um, the Olympics. Um, I know you all are going to kill it. Um, I'm going to be cheering for you all, as I always do. Um, so I wish you nothing but the best in your career. And um, after you all get that gold medal, you got to come back. Tell us all about it. <laughs> oh yeah yeah we'll book in again and i'll just actually hang on hang on hang on we're gonna we just gotta grab something hang on okay <laughs> hang on where is it where is it where is it oh there it is this is this is the inspiration this is the motivation to get another one. Oh man i'm excited <laughs> I didn't... there we go oh we want another look, one of look these. at that Oh man, see, you gotta get another one. You gotta get another gotta one because you, you gotta be able to hold both of them. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna le- let's play a game. How much do you reckon this medal weighs from me holding it like this? Maybe ten pounds. I need that in kilos. <laughs> Am I close? Oh, oh man, I don't know what ten I, pounds I don't is. Know. <laughs> Um, so this medal. I don't want to try to convert it. This medal is um, eight hundred grams. So, oh, wow. essentially a block of butter. Jeez, man, that's yeah. beautiful. So, so we want that, another one. That's, of them. that's motivation right there. Yeah. It's yeah. No, Tokyo. Yeah, I can't do wait it. for you all oh. to be able to take that home. So just they. So the Olympic gold medals in Tokyo are made out of recycled phones i think it was um and then just wow. obviously gold silver and bronze uh, bronze plated um so yeah this wow. is out of recycled phones and i think it was recycled other metals like bikes or something 
So yeah, that's they so just cool. they did it incredibly well in Tokyo. But yeah, yeah this is the motivation. No, we want another one. Y'all got it. You. I'm rooting. I'm gonna actually come to Paris. That is my goal. Um, but if not, I'll be watching, cheering. I'll be making stories saying, "Hey, I know her. I had an interview with her. <laughs> yeah, I interviewed her. <laughs> yeah, so for sure. So again, I appreciate you. Get some rest. Um, but again, I can't wait to hear all about that that win. Thank you, Santia. Yeah, it's going to be a really cool three months. Um, we've yeah. got a lot of work to do still, and uh, we've still got two more World Series um, tournaments. So Singapore is next weekend, and then we play in Madrid a month after that. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a really cool three months coming up for women's rugby. But, yeah, we're hoping that the Paris Olympics okay. will um, – just put another pin on the mat for us and we can yeah. hopefully grow the sport more. And uh, yeah, we just know that the French um, passion and uh, fan base will help uh, because they love rugby. And um, yes. yeah, we're very fortunate to play at a very prestigious stadium in Paris. So yeah, it's going to be very, yeah. very helpful for our sport to grow. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, it's, it's a, officially the countdown now. Um, so I, I know you guys are going to kill these next two tournaments and in, in, in big games. Um, so, again, I'm excited for you all. Um, make sure you're taking care of the mental as well as you go about this, because I know, uh, man, three months, I can only imagine the the just the jitters and the excitement. Um, but I know you all are, are, it seems like, excellent at the balance, which is what we we're just talking about. But, um, yeah, again, I, I'm excited to see what you all do. Thank you. I'm excited too. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. All right. Well, thank you again, Michaela. Um, again, whenever you have more time after you know your season has kind of slowed down, we would love to just kind of get perspective on what happened after the Olympics. So just be on the lookout for me reaching out. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, good luck. Thank you, Santia. Thank you so much for having me. It was cool chatting. Of course, of course. Have a good one. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>